Good afternoon, traders. Thanks for joining me today on this uh, session um, by Convergent Trading to discuss the topic of trading as a professional. Market's moving around, so my eyeballs are going to be everywhere, but, uh, but we have a, a focused topic here. We're hoping to give you some objective um, pointers, tips. Again, uh, this is public. Um, uh, this will be released on Convergent Trading's YouTube channel. Be sure to join and subscribe. We'll give you the link here in a minute. Uh, the topic again is how to trade uh, futures like a professional day trader. And I want to remind you that derivatives trading is not suitable for all investors. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. Today, uh, what we're going to cover is uh, thinking differently, uh, 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 thinking differently about trading. We want that's the ultimate goal here is to get you to uh, change your mindset potentially or think differently about uh, trading in general. We want to talk about what prop traders or pro traders think about that retails general retail traders do not. Uh, we're defining retail traders as anybody that's trading for themselves. Uh, and not doing this as a in a professional capacity. In other words, licensed or working for someone or doing it for themselves professionally as a as a as an only career. Key differences between prop versus self-directed accounts, approaching risk management like a professional, how to effectively use leverage, scalping as a day trader, the pros and cons of that. And then we're also going to talk about how to assess where you are, where you are in your development, and we'll provide some pointers on how to monitor and grow that. So let's just hop right in here. What do you guys think? So I'm going to try to make this a little bit more interactive versus just some slides on a screen and me just talking and talking and talking. Can you throw out some ideas on what you think um, think about that uh, think prop traders think about that uh, retail or self-directed traders do not? Can you you can uh, type in the uh, live chat or if you're on YouTube or if you if you if you're on GoToWebinar, you can uh, type in a chat box in front of you. What are some of the things that come to mind immediately? that you believe a professional trader would be focused on versus someone who is trading independently? What are some of those ideas? I'm gonna give you five seconds. Three, two, one. All right, let's go right into it. So the first and most important piece is that professional traders are always thinking in probabilities. This is a key factor. This is a game of mathematics. This is very much like poker, where depending on what's on the board and what you have in your hands, there are probabilities that are dynamically changing with every move, every bet, the number of players, and so on. A lot of this is uh, a lot of this is ingrained in someone who has been through the crucible of creating a professional trader. Are you thinking in probabilities? Are you someone who's thinking in probabilities? We want to, as much as possible, break things down in terms of statistics um, and what other participants in the market are doing. What is the probability that we would take out the all-time high today? And as the market is trading, just like it is today here, we rallied um, quite a bit and are pulling back currently. Uh, what are the other participants doing? Who's holding the bag? What areas have to be breached for the market to, to squeeze those traders? We want to think in those terms. So if we can probabilistically describe what's going on, that is a huge edge. It also removes us from the very difficult process of uh, getting over our losses right when we think in probabilities it, you you understand that each trade is just a sample and you're looking for the next trade the next trade the next trade versus someone who is tied up in outcomes 
uh, they're very likely to just want a winning trade. They want to constantly have a winning trade, uh, which you and I both know is not a sustainable way to trade, although a very common way that traders look at the markets. The other way prop traders think about uh, trading versus retail retailers that don't is um, how am I performing versus my peers? It is one thing to be in a uh, in an isolated room trading on our own, uh, trading on our own and um, and not getting any feedback as to how we're doing. Is it the market? Is it me? Um, and so on. It's one thing to have that versus trading with peers, trading with a group or trading in a prop environment or a, at a trade desk or performing as a as a fund manager versus the others. It changes the game. Uh, for me, uh, overall, uh, I have a little story about that, uh, uh, about that in, a, in a little bit, but to me, that was a game changer when I was learning to trade first equities as a, uh, as a SOS bandit uh, back in 2000. Uh, and then it really made a difference for me when I was in a prop environment, when I was learning futures back in 2002, I think um, it, it put, it lit a fire under me to know that someone else who started with me is actually making money and is performing well versus how I'm doing. When we're trading independently at home as retail traders, uh, we don't have that frame of reference, so things there, there's no uh, there's no feedback in that way. It's really important, and this is why tracking is very important uh, to our performance. The next thing is pushing to scale up in size. Uh, a, a professional trader or a prop trader is not generally is not looking to trade in a different way, is not constantly searching for a new method to trade or a better instrument or tool or better piece of software, faster this, better computer and so on. Those things are pretty much set. What a professional trader seeks to do is to get so good at their edge that their focus becomes all about uh, the, the performance aspect of it so we're looking at getting the right performance because the next step for a prop trader is to add size we want to get as big in a controlled environment as quickly as possible this is our entire goal because we don't make money by stretching our one lot we make money by slowly growing that one lot to a 10 lot, to a 20 lot, to a 50 lot, to a 100 lot. That's when the returns come. And as long as the product we're trading can take in that liquidity that you can get the same or almost the same execution, then nothing really changes. It's just a, it's just a mindset of changing the size. So thinking in probabilities helps that. Um, the other thing that uh, that uh, pro traders are looking for is being aggressive when the market is yielding uh, those opportunities. So we're looking for a market that is clearly directional. Uh, for example, the drop in March of 2020 during the pandemic or today's market where it pushed and it made a V bottom and it's clear that we're near all time highs Then we want to just squeeze that long trade uh, into you know yesterday's high, through yesterday's high, into last week's high, and into new all-time highs. When the market moves around like this, we want to uh, we want to um, push that edge. Hang on, what is the story here? Just one second. Landau, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Is everything yeah. operating properly? It appears that there was some, if some people are not able to get into go to webinar, there's a, they're getting a timeout or a, a error in the submission. 
it seems that we've got about 120 people on with us right now. Oh, um, it's a lot less than what was registered. Yeah. There almost a thousand registered. Yeah. So I'm not sure what's making the difference between who can log on and who can't. Okay. They they might be seeing some issues on their end. In either case, I'm going to go through this content and those people can get the recording. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure what the technical issue is. I want to apologize to anybody that could not get in who wanted to. Um, we expect the the software that we're using to work properly. It's third-party software. We don't have control of it. So we'll release the recording as quickly as we can. So uh, being aggressive during key events. That doesn't mean that I'm going to throw maximum size on at the FOMC decision or at the non-farm payrolls or something like that. It just simply means um, it just simply means that I'm going to um, know my edge and push that edge when it shows up because the market cycles, the market uh, the market process is not always in our favor. The market kind of cycles through different regimes, and there are periods of drought. There are periods where uh, I would normally trade anywhere between five and 20 times a day if the market's really volatile uh, to trading maybe once seeing just one setup a day or two setups a day tops some days nothing uh, so during the time when there is uh, a feeding frenzy we want to be a part of that uh, generally uh, retail type traders because they're trading for themselves and don't have the frame of reference through others, generally step back during the time when, when we should be aggressive and are allowing losers to get too big during a time when we should be stepping back, or worse, over trading during times of dry opportunity. We see that all the time. So the last thing I wanna talk about is clearly tracking my zones. As a pro trader, I'm not just trading in the middle of nowhere. I am clearly tracking where I expect the market to respond, and I am only acting in those areas. I'll give you an example of that. Here's my here's my footprint chart, so to speak, the volume chart. These gray zones, these are my stock zones. Those of you who watch the Daily Trader Byte have seen these zones before and know that uh, these are areas of interest. This is where I'm expecting the market to respond. So you could see here, it didn't get to the 4707, which is last week's high, but you can see the, the pullback. So if I missed the long earlier, I'm not going to buy it here, 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 here. Not going to buy it just because it's chopping around. I'm going to buy it in my stock zone area. So that translates to my execution platform where you can see the same stock zone here, and I'm essentially looking for how does it come down so I can see that somebody swept. I can see that it's pushing into this pullback area, key pullback area, and I'm looking for a response. And that response is a breakout long in the direction of the greater trend for the day. So I'm looking for a long, and that long is likely to be executed around 95 in this area. So I'm looking for a true reversal to take place. So lower high, lower high, lower high, higher high, first indication that this level is getting respect. So we have an impulse continuation and then we have a reversal pattern and I'm looking to, to take out to trade in the direction of the break uh, past the reversal bar. So that's a very simple setup. Um, so that's that's me deciding ahead of time where the trade is. And because I know that the next stock zone is at 4,700, that I'm looking to scale some of that 95 long, 95, 95, 50, what's a couple of tick, ticks among friends. And I'm looking to scale before that 4,700 comes in. Just because I got into the trade doesn't mean that I want to hold it for 100 points unless that's your plan. I'm looking to trade from zone to zone to zone. And I know just to the left here is a cluster or a zipper at the high, and that would be my next scale out area. So the next scale out area would be two ticks ahead of the 4,700, 4,699.50. And then 
I'm expecting the market to chop around because there's a stock zone there. There's a reason for that stock zone being there. I expect the market to chop around. My risk control, now that the market has done a full rotation, my risk control now can safely move to break even in case it does not continue and it collapses. But if it clears the 4,700, I know I need to work something in the 4,703 and then I need to stop scaling and let the market go to the key target above which is 47.1175 the all-time high so you can see that there's a map here and i've shown you this in the daily trader bites that i do at 9 a.m every day posted on my twitter feed um i have a map even in areas that we haven't traded yet i have a map you can see these stock zones and they just go on and on and on and on very important to know where that is and of course, with this platform, I have MBO data, so I get a lot of feedback. So I can see that there's some size here at the 4,700. That size was not here until we came here. So that size, the offer at 260, this red line here is likely to pull on the next push up. It hasn't, it hasn't had any lasting effect. It didn't come in as soon as we dropped through. It came in right after we tested. So it's very likely to be a, a spoofing order or a fake order okay uh, i know that's a lot of information that i just uh, shared with you but i want to make this um conversation a practical one and that's the process the process is to allow the market to move into predefined zones and that doesn't always mean a fixed stock zone it could be a market generated level like initial balance, uh, full session or, or RTH VWAP. It could be um, the RTH or full session mid. It could be the opening swing high or low. It could be uh, the prior high or low. It could be a low volume node or a string of singles on the, on the market profile and so on and so forth. This is, so I, I'm not sitting here trying to find trades. I'm simply sitting here like a hunter perched on my stand and I'm waiting for the opportunity to show up and there are some days where I have to come off the stand as the market closes and I haven't fired a shot for the day and that's just how it is. Whereas somebody who's trading independently is out there and feel, a lot of people feel like I'm not doing anything unless I'm trading and that's not going to be in your best interest because you're not trading probabilistically anymore. You are simply trading what you want to see and the outcomes are likely not to be favorable. Key differences between prop versus self-directed accounts. So I'm not gonna ask you the question. It seems like um, participation is slow and I don't wanna make this longer than, than it needs to be. The key uh, items between difference between someone who's trading professionally or for prop or a trade desk versus self-directed or retail is the structure is set when you're in a prop environment the structure is set you don't spend any time tinkering you're not going to put together a new computer you're not going to update your memory during market hours you're not going to replace that video card you're not going to do another demo of another platform you're not going to try that new cool new pl platform that somebody showed you uh, you're not going to be distracted and tinkering the structure is set your desk is set, the services are set, you don't change them. There's an IT person who makes those changes. Everything is locked, you can't install things or remove things. So that entire distraction is out of the picture. So when we sit down to trade, it is really about the market. It is us immersed in the markets. If you play video games, you know that in the middle of the action, you can't be looking everywhere and watching CNBC or whatever. You have to be focused on the action in that video game. The market is the same. It doesn't mean that I'm gonna focus enough to invent trades or zoom in or get down to a tick chart to find a trade, but it means that I'm watching the auction and how it's behaving, okay? I'm gonna sprinkle in the current action today to explain how that is. For example, if I'm distracted, then I probably am not watching to see that the market has just pulled back from the 4,700 stock zone and is coming back to my entry. And I'm just relying passively on a stop. There may be an opportunity here. This may be a lower high that's creating failure that is likely to push us back into 4,688. 
the low 46.88 being the full session VWAP right here, or potentially even into 46.85, uh, 46 which is uh, yesterday's settlement. So uh, this, you know, I need to stay in, in current with what's going on. Again, I'm not looking to trade every tick, but I'm staying up to date, so there's no tinkering. The other thing is the process. The key element, it, it doesn't take me long to see if somebody's really going to make it or if they're just wasting an opportunity, time, and money for my prop shop. I can tell probably within a couple of weeks. You know, there's there's probably uh, they're, they're a couple of weeks, depending on how quickly they get through the material, or a couple of weeks to a month of self-study, um, independent study, and prep. But as soon as they start to trade, I can tell if they are process-oriented or they're more into gambling and they're looking for the next winning trade. We have zero interest in trading. We have zero interest in the next winning trade. Not interested in the next winning trade. What we're interested in is the edge. And the edge can only show up by following a process and repeating it and repeating it. In other words, if we're playing soccer, let's say, the goal is not to get the ball and kick it towards the goal from wherever you are in the field. That would be very frustrating for your teammates and it would, it would yield no results. That's essentially how a lot of people trade. They get the ball, okay, now I'm in action, and they're just trying to just either get rid of it or lob it towards the goal. As a professional, we want to set up a play. We get the ball, we take a read of what's on going on in the field, we look for opportunities, and we pass it off, and we put ourselves in a position to get it back so that we can score. So we're, we're very connected with the process versus – Every time I'm going to get the, goal, the ball, I'm going to shoot for the goal. Have you ever played basketball with someone that every time you pass them the ball, they take a shot every single time? Very frustrating. It doesn't get your team anywhere because generally when they do that, they're not taking good opportunities. And their goal internally is just to make a shot. A goal is not to make a shot. The goal is to follow the plan and the process. And so when you learn to play professionally, basketball or whatever, volleyball, you name it, it's to set up the play. The goal is to take the time to set up the play and then only strike at the goal or spike the ball or shoot for the basket when you have a high probability shot. Trading is the same, except the people we're playing it with are playing against are all professionals. Not necessarily you and me, because we make money by value changing. We don't necessarily, I don't necessarily have to dig into your pocket to make money. This is not how it works. I know a lot of people say that, but this is not how it works. So have a ritual, follow the ritual, because that's what yields results. The next thing we want to talk about is moving on quickly. So I can't tell you how many times traders would do the homework and follow this and set up their charts and everything, and then they take the trade, and then they need that trade. I need that trade to make money. So even if it takes me taking out, you know, cutting off any potential for this trade by scaling out for two ticks instead of holding it for 15 points, um, you know, 60 ticks versus two ticks, um, the, the, the key thing here is to hang on to that outcome can't afford to do that when you're trading professionally because the market is just continuing. And as we move into crypto trading, uh, the market is continuing 24 seven. So not only do you have to box in your process, but you cannot afford, it's very expensive, it's very costly to sit and meditate on, deal with or emotionally have to deal with every single trade because there's a need that every trade has to work. So professionally, we the biggest difference between someone who's, who's doing this for a living and somebody who's trading independently is there's just way too much time spent dwelling on the last trade. Took the trade, it worked or didn't work, grade it, note it, journal it or whatever, 
move on. Look, go back, reset, look at your uh, key trade inputs and or triggers and look for that, wait for that next trade, okay? The other piece here is never mess with your risk. When you set your risk plan, and we'll go over one today, we'll get into the nuts and bolts of doing that. I'm going to offer you um, risk settings uh, or how I do risk settings for various products. Don't ever play with your risk uh, uh, risk parameters. You don't want to move a stop away or move, choke a trade or, or move a stop too quickly. You don't want to tell yourself that I only have um, $300 worth of risk for the day before I hit my daily limit and I have to stop and then find yourself losing 3,000. Whatever that is, it's done. In a prop environment, you can't do that because there's a risk manager and the risk manager will shut you off remotely. They'll disable your platform if you're not paying attention and there are consequences because the money is not yours, it's the firm's money and we, although everybody understands that you're going to have one or two limit down days a month or a quarter or whatever, it's understood that that's part of the game. What nobody expects and respects is that you continue to trade through your stop limits. Uh, this, is, this is an important distinction. I've seen traders come in, open an account. I see it at EdgeClear here all the time. Open an account. And those are the traders that are always asking for the lowest margin and the lowest commission they come in go through the process of opening an account and just waste everybody's time because they get on and they put on a trade and then they defend it and defend it and defend it and then we have to blow them out and and debit their account uh, because they just couldn't re uh, respect the the risk controls they didn't have risk controls at all no distractions during active hours i know twitter's a big piece of information that people generally use but especially during the active hours the first two hours and the last 45 minutes of your market it's really important to just leave that out unless it's giving you information that you have to have as an input to your trade it is best to shut off i don't watch cnbc couldn't care less i do have news feeds multiple so i'm not missing anything and besides cnbc announces things 20 seconds to minutes later, I want to hear it as it happens, as the as the price action is responding. So CNBC is just filling air. Uh, if I have it on and I don't have it on, I don't have a TV in my office. Uh, in addition to that, I don't turn anything on in the morning in the first two hours that I don't I don't have to have on. So cut back on the distractions, cut back on the interruptions. People cannot ask you to do things. You cannot go and pick up that FedEx package. You cannot take out the garbage uh, during your focused hours. There are hours of the day where you and the market exists and nothing else does. The market is king. That's it. Okay. So let's talk about approaching risk management like a professional. Let me ask you guys, how are you setting your stop size? How are you determining what your stop size should be. Can someone tell me? I'm going to grab a sip while you do that. Are we getting anything on uh, YouTube, Landau? Nobody's answered yet. I think there's a slight delay on YouTube, though, so we might have to wait a couple seconds. I see. So, anybody? How are you setting your stop size? How are you setting your daily limit? Somebody says approximately 1%, ATR times 1.5, 2% of my account size, 1% of my account size. Very good. Those are good answers. 1% um, is okay, but does 1% make sense? So percent of account is a very common thing that's used to set limits. But 1% is generally used for per trade. And generally that is that is pulled in from uh, stock trading. You don't want to risk more than 
1% of your portfolio on any given stock or whatever. And so you size the stock, depending on its price, uh, you size the stock purchase or the number of contracts you take or uh, shares you take uh, based on that. In day trading futures, there's a different factor that has to be accounted for. We have to rely on statistics. How do you know that, you know, you need X amount of dollars for a daily limit because once you surpass that limit, there's a very low probability that we would make a comeback. So if I take uh, three full stops in a row, how likely, statistically speaking, if I look at my journal, if I look at my trade log, how likely is it that I would make a comeback from that? Uh, for me, it's very unlikely. It's very unlikely. Chances are I'll basically churn for the rest of the day, run up my commissions and, and fees and not really get anywhere. So we'll talk about how I'm doing it because the 1% thing is usable. Using a one and a half ATR is simply factoring volatility into that. But what if the volatility is in the product you're trading is um, creating $3,500 stops and your account's $5,000, right? The volatility has expanded so much. So you have to, there's, there's an additional layer that has to come into it. So how do we figure this out statistically? And the goal with figuring out the statistical part of this is because one, we don't want to choke a trade. Um, I know that everybody here, I don't even have to ask, I know everybody here has tried to use very small stops and have choked a trade. In other words, you know, the, the trade moves in your direction six ticks, say in the Russell or, or the S&P or NASDAQ, and NASDAQ six ticks is nothing. Six ticks is one print. Um, you move your stop to break even, it comes back, it hits your stop, it goes through by a couple of ticks and then it takes off and it goes away 60, 70, 100 ticks in your direction. That's when we choke a trade. How do we know when we can move our stop to break even or when we can create a, uh, a, a trailing stop for our specific product? So every product has natural rotations and i've talked about harmonic rotations in the past there are videos that i've done for futures io and so on about this and we talk about this at convergent trading all the time you need to know your product's rotations and whatever you do it's a statistical measure so it's in the past but it's better than just saying ah for the s p i just use a two-point stop how do you know what if the rotations in the S&P are 13 points like they were last year during the, during the beginning of the pandemic? We had, at that point, you had to use about a 14 to 17 point stop uh, to stay in rotations on a one minute time frame. So natural rotations or harmonic rotations are very important to know. Uh, we update these every Sunday for convergent members, really, really important factor in, in organizing or putting together a trade. Uh, rotations dictate the level of noise. I'm gonna show you the rotations. I'm gonna share with you the latest report. Again, these are updated uh, weekly, but I'm gonna share with you the latest report on rotations here. And these tell you how much noise there may be as a result of volatility or some change in the product. Our stop must be on the edge on the edge of or outside of this noise. We don't want to stop that's inside the noise. We don't want to be stopped out and then have the market go in our direction as it's chopping around like it's doing right now. So I don't want to sit here and use a two point stop when it's swinging seven points at a time. Yeah, it looks like seven points at a time right now. We use harmonic rotations to figure this out statistically. Um, and then what we have to do once we figure out the harmonic rotations is we have to then correlate that with market structure. So once we know how big a stop we have to use, how big a scale out we have to have, how big a target we have to have, we have to overlay that on the market structure. 
because even though we're using statistics, we're trading market structure, we're trading the auction. I'm gonna show you an example of this. So I basically project where my stops are gonna be. And the first step to this process, and this is the one of the most important tips you can take from here. This is the harmonic rotation chart that was posted to convergent members on Sunday night. I do these myself. And this is based, these are the, the most popular products, uh, ESNQ, Russell, Dow, Crude, FDAX, uh, Euro Stocks 50, Bund, the 10-year, the 6E, which is the Euro uh, US dollar pair in the futures, and GC, which is gold. We can, we're gonna phase in Bitcoin and micro ETH, which is coming out December 7th. And micro Bitcoin is already trading. We can phase those in and they'll be added to this chart. We're looking at 20 sessions for these rotations. How do these rotations evolve over the last 20 sessions? Okay. We define what the session is. For some products, it is just the full session. For some product, it is uh, the, the cash session. Uh, there's a pit session for uh, certain products and so on and so forth. Like crude doesn't have a cash session. And, um, you know, is it the Eurozone? So we're, I generally figure out the rotations for the active hours. But what you should do is figure out the rotations during your trading time. So if you're trading at night in a U.S. product, because that's the only time you can trade, you should know the rotations for that period. They're going to be less. Uh, we look at a one minute chart and then we define what the tick size is. That's called the bin size here. What is the tick size for the S&P? A tick size is one quarter of a point. Uh, for the DAX, it's one point. For the Euro stocks, it's half a point and so on. And then the fractal bar setting is simply telling us what, how do we determine what a swing is? So what this is doing is it's looking at a one minute bar chart and it is, it's looking at a one minute bar chart and it's uh, it's it's looking for a structure, a market structure high or a market structure low that is made up of five bars. So you have one bar, another bar that's higher, and then you have a peak bar, and then you have a lower high and a lower high. As soon as we get the five bar formation, we make sure that we mark that top as a top and we measure that top versus the last low. And this is all done on a rotations chart automatically. So here's the rotational chart, okay? So you see those fractals? They're being the green and like reddish, pinkish. Those are rotations. Those rotations are plotted. This product here is the Dow, happens to be the Dow. It is the cash session. I'm in Chicago. So the cash session is 8.30 till 3 p.m central time or exchange time and then we plot those rotations at the bottom positive rotations in this pane negative rotations in this pane and then we chart and this is the unique and important part we chart a histogram we don't use an average because averages describe a normal distribution there's relatively it's relatively rare that the market has a normal distribution when it comes to data and so we set it up so that it's telling us what a normal rotation is 35 to 9 points up the most common rotation is 13 points in a dow so that's the most common rotation an impulse a 90th percentile move is 58 points and so on and so forth from that chart we get this data that we see here and then from this data, we then figure out the stops. So let's look at the S&P. That's the most product, uh, most popular product here. Let's look at how we're using this data. This isn't just academics. And by the way, I wanna emphasize that these values change on a weekly basis. So you might be able to grab them right here. These are up to date for this week, but they will change next week, ever so slightly, depending on whether volatility expands and contracts, and we can't predict that. So use at your own risk. These are not fixed. Uh, they could change. Uh, they've been going down and down and down as volatility has been falling off. But let's look at the S&P. The pullback uh, that we use to measure uh, any rotation is 11 ticks. And impulse is at eight and a quarter points. Impulse up is eight and a quarter points in the S&P. And impulse down is seven and a half points. 
and and a normal rotation up is five and a quarter points. A normal rotation down is five points. And I'm going to show you exactly how I have it set up in my platform. This is my trading platform. This is Edge Pro X. You can find this on at edgeprox.com. And we're going to go and look at the strategies oops, that are set up in here. So I have these products that I'm active in. And this is how it's set up. It's in ticks. Notice that the stop is 12 ticks. The zigzag is 11. So it's the zigzag plus one. Okay. My first target is 10 ticks. Can somebody tell me why my first target is 10 ticks? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Why is it 10 ticks when my stop is 12? That's not a very good R factor, is it? So I'm scaling in, in thirds here on a, on a 12 lot. So I'm using 10 ticks because, again, the zigzag is 11. So I want to have my stop just outside of the zigzag pullback value. And I want to be, I want to scale out just inside. So I'm scaling, I'm taking a stop of 12 ticks and I'm taking my first scale just a first scale, this is a risk mitigation scale of 10 ticks. So now I know that I've got it so, set up so that I'm somewhere inside of the noise uh, for my scale out and I'm somewhere outside of the no uh, noise for my stop. The next scale is 20 ticks. Can anybody guess how I got those 20 ticks? I'm sure you don't remember what this chart said. So it's 20 ticks because the normal rotation is five points. So I'm looking to scale the most of my size five points in. This is what's going to give me a positive R factor. And an R factor is simply how much I can, if the trade worked out, how much I can gain versus how much I'm risking. So if I'm trading, say, a three lot, which is what I would recommend for the micro ES, for example, um, if I'm trading a three lot, if I get stopped for three points, that's nine points of risk. Once I get filled, the 10 ticks on the first scale, the 20 ticks on the second scale, and the 32 ticks on the third scale, I'm expecting my R factor to be somewhere around 2.0. In this case, actually, the R factor is exactly with this trading scheme, the R factor for the S&P, given the way the rotations are, is 1.722. I know these numbers. You should know these numbers. These are statistical numbers and they determine your profitability. If you have not thought about R factors and rotations, it's a really tough thing to stay in business not knowing them. And then the last um, scale out, which is the runner, which I adjust, so once I get filled on the first scale, the second scale, the third scale is adjusted based on how the market's responding. So I'm trailing that runner, but immediately the software puts it on there so that I have it out there with my stop for 32 ticks. And I won't get into how, how I'm coming up with that. So I'm about to trade, so I'm, I'm looking to take this long. What I do is I place my I place my cursor on where I want to buy. Sorry, I'm like getting the sniffles here. Where I want to buy. And what I'm looking at is that four. You see that four beneath? That's my stop. It's actually 12. It's just showing me the first of my stops. I want that four to be structurally um, in a spot that makes sense. Okay. So this is what I'm looking for. If I and then assume and then I'm looking for that where my stop is going to be. That's that four that's coming up and down. So if I buy at earlier, I said I wanted uh, 95.50. My stop would have been 92.50. Am I okay with the 92.50 stop? I can see the 92 quarter is the last low. Yes, I'm okay because I know that if it makes it through the noise and through the 93 then it's probably wrong. We're going to see new lows and I don't need to pay extra to find out. I don't, I don't like the 
Let's go to the low plus one tick. I think that's a sucker stop. Once it pulls back into the high volume within the um, that battle area, within this battle area here, I know that chances are my stop's going to get triggered. Now, if I take the 95.50, the next thing I want to check is do my exits make sense? 98 is the first scale out. That is my risk mitigation scale out. That's going to give me some funding to hold on to the trade. It's going to improve my average for my stop or for my entry. Then the next trade, the next out is 4,750. Is that good? Am I okay with that? The last high is 4,700.75. You can see it right here, 4,700.75. So if I bought 95.50, I'm okay with 4,700.5 because I'm looking to get out just below that last high. So it's perfect. And then, of course, where's my last exit? My last exit's at 4,703. But as soon as I get into the trade, I'm going to drag that exit into an area that is structural, that makes sense. So I can improve my R factor from 1.722 that I mentioned to 2.03 for whatever. Okay. I know more, that. Can you yeah. elaborate on uh, how win rate and R factor play in each other? There's a conversation going on in the chat where uh, a couple guys were saying you need a 51% win rate. Um, no, you and don't. Yes. You can have you can have a 16% win rate and a positive R factor. R factors don't have to do too much with win rates because R factors are simply describing. How much am I risking on the entire trade? That's my stop times the quantity that I'm taking. So if it's a three lot for a 12 tick stop or a three point stop, that's nine points. Once I get my scale outs, wherever those are, then I am getting um, whatever that is. Then I'm getting if I if I get all of my scale outs, then I'm getting approximately. Oops. 62 ticks. So I'm risking 12 ticks times three. Okay, 36, and I'm 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 potentially getting 62 ticks. That's all the R factor there is. So it's based on structuring a trade. This Nobody ever talks about this. It's a very important piece. This is your biggest piece that you're going to take away today. You, know, you need to know that if I get filled on all of my trades, on my scale outs, do they more than compensate for the risk? You need an R factor of 1.25 or better in order to stay in the game. This way, you can have several losses and it's okay. They'll pay for themselves. If your R factor is at one or below, this is not a profit factor. Profit factor is win rate versus the amount you can win versus the amount you can use, lose. This is really the structure of the trade. What is my stop versus all of my fills for this particular trade, for this particular trade? A, a profit factor is over a series of trades. Okay, you can figure out the R factor, the profit factor over a series of trades, but each trade has to be structured to have uh, an R factor. And it's simple math. Okay, so this is a really important piece because it's what keeps you in business long term. So I think I'm getting too long here with this, too much detail. I want to take a moment, step back for a second, and remind you to. Uh, subscribe to the Convergent Trading YouTube channel because we do release helper videos, little shorts and things like that, that uh, Landau here does a fantastic job on, on our YouTube channel. And they're intended, just like we're talking about here, they're intended to help you see things more professionally because that's what Convergent Trading is about. It is a, a, a community or a structure that's designed um, by me and others to help traders move away from the YouTubers who are just showing their screen and doing whatever uh, to you creating a structure and starting to trade more professionally and more sustainably. Okay, so you can reach our YouTube channel and subscribe by going to go to ct.pro forward slash ct-youtube, all lowercase. 
that should put you in a subscription screen. Just hit yes, and you'll be subscribed and notified when another um, video gets uploaded. We're going to move on to how to effectively use leverage. A quick look at notional value. The notional value of any product is the index point value times the price. So I'm looking at the NASDAQ here. The NASDAQ's trading at 16,427. 16,427. What is the notional value of the NASDAQ? Very simple math that I don't want to do in my head. 16,427, and it's $20 a point. Oops. 16,427 times $20. That's the value of each NASDAQ contract, the full NQ. That's a lot. The S&P trading, call it at 4,700, it's $50 per point, $235,000. That's the notional value. In other words, if you have $235,000 in your account and you buy one contract at 4,700 and the S&P's price plummets to zero, you'll lose $235,000. But nobody trades with notional values. So we use leverage in futures. Okay, and that lever leverage is then represented in the form in a form that's called a margin. What this is is the exchange is saying, look, you know, when you trade stocks, you put up the full notional value. So if you're buying two shares of a thousand dollar stock, you're going to be debited two thousand dollars. In futures, it doesn't work that way because we're taking advantage of the idea that it's very unlikely that a commodity or an index is gonna go to zero. So what the exchange does is it does a computation that looks at what is the, I think, sixth standard deviation move on one contract in the S&P or the NASDAQ, and it determines what that amount is. And it says, that's what you have to put up. That's what you have to put up in terms of margin. So as an example, Right now for the popular products like the ES, the margin is $12,650. So what this is saying is if you buy one contract and the market drops a six standard deviation move in the session, in any given session, you know, from when it opens at 8 p.m. the prior night till 5 p.m. today, chances are $12,650 should cover that risk. That's what margin means. So what does that mean? The pros and cons of margin is I don't have to put up $235,000 to trade the S&P. I only have to put up $12,650 if I'm using 100% of exchange margin, a very small fraction of that, right? So what kind of leverage are we talking about at the exchange level? We divide this by 12650. We're talking about 18 to 1 leverage from the exchange. Here's the crazy part. The crazy part is that people out there, traders out there, especially retail traders, go out there and look for $300 margins. So what does it mean to trade with, let's call it $500 margins? $500 margins, you're trading for 470 to one of risk, 470 to one. So what does that mean? It would take, a 0.212% move in the index, in the S&P, to wipe out your account, to wipe out that margin value. It is not the point being, understand these numbers, understand margin. It is not smart to trade with $500 or $1,000 margins when the product's initial margin is $12,650. It is actually stupid. So, sorry that it is, because it would take far too little to wipe you out at that rate. This is why we pushed for the micro products. The micro is one tenth, so what that's saying is every micro contract requires, micro ES contract requires $1,265, $1,265, and then your broker, if they're reasonable, should be giving you 50% credit on that margin. So for $1,265, now you can trade two contracts instead of one intraday. You can't hold those into the close. You can trade those intraday. If you're experienced, 
they may give you 25% of initial margin, which means that if you put up the margin amount, which by the way, for the NASDAQ is $18,700 for the full contract, for the minis and uh, whatever, 18, um, yeah, 1870 for the micros. And what that means is basically uh, we are, we are deleveraging the fact that we are highly re leveraged. What are the pros and cons of margin? The pros are, I don't have to, look, I'm never gonna hold a position until it goes to zero. So why should I take all this money and park it at my clearing firm or my broker dealer for a stock? That's not a very efficient use of my capital. So I get to trade a small portion of the market, small moves in the market, for less money so the the futures have a much uh, better um efficient or much more efficient use of capital versus equities for example uh futures don't stop you from getting short or long of course and there is no such thing as a short list or hard to short or anything like that the cons of leverage uh, and the other pro of leverage is if you are making money and you have a positive expectancy and you're a good trader you can really take off the cons of tr of leverage is that is that is that many 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 places far too many places give people 470 to 1 leverage on the notional value and what that means is you lose your money faster and what it also means is for many traders it brings up too much emotion it causes too much fear and too much greed too much jitter uh, it is smart for you as a somebody who's aspiring to be a professional. I'm sure this is why you're listening to me right now. It is smarter for you to just stick stick with 50% of exchange margins, if not 25% on the outside. So if you're with a broker because you only have $1,200 and you want to trade the micros and you want to trade the NASDAQ and your broker is allowing you to do that for 50 bucks a contract, in my opinion, you're digging a hole for yourself that's very, very difficult to get out of because once you have a losing streak, that losing streak unfolds very quickly against you. A more responsible broker would tell you that, say, for a NASDAQ or an S&P, you, really you really should be trading somewhere fi around $500, $300 to $500 per contract on the micro. So if you're not funded well enough for this, the probabilities are not going to be in your favor. Simple mathematics and statistics. So the, the next thing I want to talk about is adjusting for volatility and account size. The adjustment for volatility and account size is confined by two things. This chart, this chart is one. The volatility increases, the rotations increase, your stops increase. And that has to be constrained by the answer that many of you so intelligently provided. And that is, I'm only risking 1% at the outside, 2% per trade. So there's a point where the rotational statistics get so big, you can't risk less than 2% per trade. At that point, what do you do? Take a guess. What would you do as a trader if the rotations have gotten so big that now you've reached the limit of 1% or 2%, whatever you choose, per trade what do you do then anybody take a guess i'm not that scary what do you do when the market becomes so volatile that you cannot maintain a one or two percent per trade risk on your account size we're giving trade a less volatile instrument uh size down many people are saying size down uh one half of the normal rotation Stay flat, don't trade. Very good. See, everybody's got this figured out. Your options are find a less volatile instrument or a smaller instrument to trade. Trade, trade less size. The other option is to fund your bigger, uh, fund your account more if you want to trade that product so that your risk of ruin remains the same, not recommended, or not to trade at all. Okay, so the, that's, those are smart answers. Now, the, the other side of the equation is when do you add a contract? 
I'll tell you when you add a contract, if you're doing this professionally, you add a contract every time your account increases by the margin amount required to trade that contract. So just because I had two or three or a week or two weeks of great trading does not mean I should double my size. How I, do, how I increase my size is I look at my account and I again look at the statistics. If I've increased my account by enough, meaning to cover a, the risk or the margin on an additional contract, then I add an additional contract. As soon as I fall back through, I cut that contract. If I've been trading so well that my size has grown to add two more contracts, then I add another contract, give myself time to adjust, add a second contract. If then I go through a rough patch and I lose that amount, I cut a contract and then I cut another contract. That's how we do it. That's how we do it, okay? So you don't just randomly by feel, hey, I think I've got this great system, let me throw a 10 lot on here. That doesn't work out. Scalping as a day trader, I'm gonna do this very quickly because we're way over our time. I got into way too much detail here. Scalping as a trader, what are the pros? The pros are the duration of exposure is very short. So you get in, you get out, and it's very short. You're taking nibbles at the market. Um, you have to have a high win percent because you're generating a lot of cost. Uh, there's no need to have a directional bias. I can, I have scalped short in an uptrend uh, based on order flow, or I've scalped long in a downtrend. I've scalped in a sideways market from the outside in. I've scalped a breakout from the inside out. There's no need to form a huge amount of bias or to do a lot of study to be able to scalp. That's another pro. You're, the other pro is you're taking a large number of trades, which means you have a lot of opportunity, a lot of repetitions, and you're able to capture your edge more easily versus someone who trades once a week. You trade once a week and that trade doesn't work out. Well, you had a losing week. The scalper might trade 30, 50, 100 times a day, and it's just that in that frequency, you get many opportunities to get closer and closer and closer to your true edge. Um, scalping is works the same in slower or faster markets. So I've had guys scalp from the time they sit their butt in the chair at 7.20 a.m. Central time all the way to the close at 4 p.m. Central time. And they just trade all the way through the day. So you don't have to have a certain type of movement to scalp. You're looking for ticks or a couple points, and that's one of the pros as well. So you're always engaged and you're always in the flow. Here are the cons. The cons are very serious, and that's why scalping is not for everybody. You must always be in the flow when you're scalping. So as you watch these guys scalp or you, you, you get emails from somebody who's teaching you how to scalp, just remember that it's really hard uh, to maintain flow all the time. For scalping, you need to be in the flow all the time. You just need to be in line with the market's waves and ebb and flow. Bad days can be very expensive because as a scalper, you don't have a choice but to go and take the next trade. And so if your flow is wrong, it, it can create a hole very, very quickly. I've done it, trust me. Uh, cost structure is prohibitive. Uh, your exchange fees go dramatically higher your commissions go dramatically higher. Uh, also, your infrastructure has to be much better. You have to have a much better computer. You have to have much better broadband and connectivity. I used to pay for a T1 line uh, to my home when I moved to Washington, D.C. in 2005. Uh, I paid for a T1 line back to the Chicago Board of Trade office, my prop office. Uh, it cost me like $2,500 a month. So my overall overhead cost was around $6,000 a month to trade that with TT, CQG integrated client, news feed, uh, all this stuff. It gets really, really expensive to have that reliability. Your speed, uh, connectivity, as I just said, you have to have incredible discipline. You cannot let a bad trade get away from you or add to a bad trade just this one time. Scalping is scalping. It's a very quick hit and run type of situation. You should not be hesitating at all. It is tough to grow beyond a certain point. There was a time where you could 
hit the market for 300 lots in the ES. It's, this is true. And get filled at one price. You can't do that these days. Liquidity is a lot thinner. Uh, the markets are moving a lot more. And so you're limited by the amount that you can take. And the, because of the higher volatility, uh, losses can accumulate very quickly, just as profits can as well. Also, when you're scalping, and this is why many, many prop shops went out of business, is because from 2005 onwards, this space was uh, completely taken over by high frequency trading and algos, as well as automated market makers. And you're competing with that level. You're comp competing with co located nanosecond based fills and um, uh, raising in that environment, raising your time frame. Coming out of scalping is the smarter move, not going towards it. Also, when you're a scalper, there's a lot of myopia. Uh, somebody who's scalping is really focused on the DOM and isn't really seeing where the market's going. It's very hard to maintain a big picture view when you're scalping, as well as staying in the flow and trading the flow itself. And scalping, every tick matters. So traders tend to just close in and kind of focus on a very small factor. Um, okay, I thought I switched that. How to assess where you are in your development. This is the end of it. Don't measure your success in dollars. I know that's so hard for many people to accept, but don't measure whether you did well today or not in terms of dollars. It's, it's not the way to go. You, you, if you measure your success as a professional or as a day trader trading for yourself, uh, in terms of dollars, you have a very volatile relationship with the market. Better growth comes from being able to see what others are doing versus your own progress. The story I was going to share with you was I moved to Chicago with a friend who got me into trading. Neither he nor I have ever traded. We sat next to each other. He's a very dedicated, focused trader. He's very successful trading equities. And you know, we would complain to each other about how hard it is, the struggle, and so on and so forth. And I'm in my own world, he's in his own world, except when we're complaining to each other. And then one day in a discussion, it came out that he was actually making a lot of money. He was he had he had paid back his debit, his drawdown in prop, and he was actually making money to the tune of, I don't remember, maybe twenty or twenty-five thousand dollars a month or something. When I found out, I got really angry because I realized that one, why is he making money and I'm not? It really told me that I wasn't pushing. Two, I heard all the complaints, but I did not hear the successes. So I wasn't able to benefit from the success, although I was held down by the, I allowed myself to be held down by the complaining. Complaining with other people, oh, they took this, they did that or whatever helps us make excuses for our performance. I'm just being very blunt with you here. I was doing the same thing. But once I found out that he was making a couple thousand dollars a day, uh, it made everything very real for me. And so it's to develop, you must have contact with others. We have accountability services at Convergent. You can create this on your own. I try to connect people through the Trader Byte. But if you don't know what others are doing and why they're struggling versus what your struggle is, uh, we you, you're living in a universe where there's no accountability and there's nothing to compel you to move forward because you don't know. You don't know, you know, if you're a runner and you're, you know, you're you're doing 15 minute miles, you don't re you think that hey that's the extent of your effort, but if you find out that actually somebody who started with you is now doing eight minute miles and they are running at a competitive level, it changes things. It tells you that, wait, maybe the standard I'm setting for myself is not good enough. Maybe I'm not focused enough. And it changes how we play the game. Remember to grade every trade, not based on the outcome. We don't care about the outcome, at least not at the beginning. Grade every trade based on the process that created the trade and how you executed it. I know many people talk about this, but if unless you do this, you're going to be in the cycle and it's a repeating vicious cycle of had a good day, feel good, come back the next day, blow out, feel bad, wanting to give up, questioning things, trying to get money back. Don't do that. 
create a process, a ritual, stick to it, focus on it, and only look at how you execute it versus the opportunities. Why? Because the market is random. The outcome is random. The trades are random. So you don't get to control what the outcome is. You do not get to control what the outcome is. So why are you using a random outcome-based situation to grade your performance? Uh, it's, it's better to just focus on how you're following the process and how you're following your plan. Track errors. So I'm gonna share the errors with you. Track errors. These things will eat your lunch. Errors are the key drag on growth. So unless you address your errors, there's just no way to grow. The key errors are not taking a planned trade. The key errors I've always tracked are not take, taking a planned trade. That's an error. Jot down the error number. Jot down, jot down what it cost you. So if the market ended up moving in your direction and giving you all scale outs in the ES, as I said, 62 ticks is what that error cost me, and I record 62 ticks lost. And I want to keep track of all those uh, ticks that I've lost as a result of errors so I can get a real understanding of what these errors are costing me. Uh, the second error is interfering with a trade management while in a trade. So uh, you get into a trade and all of a sudden you're so much smarter and you see things better and you close the trade even though the trade hasn't violated any of your set parameters. The third error is chasing a trade for fear of missing out. You didn't, it's not really a trade, you heard somebody take it or it didn't quite set up, but you just decided I'm not gonna miss this one, I missed the last one, you just get in there. That's an error, what did that cost you? Technical errors, you're buying too many or selling uh, or selling when you wanted to buy, exiting when you just wanted to reduce the position, just clicking errors, things like that. Fifth error is allowing outside influences while in a trade, either through someone else's advice or view of the market by allowing others to interfere with your mid trade. In other words, I have to close a trade because I have a phone call or I'm long and somebody I think who makes money is short, so I close my trade. But the fact is both of you have an equal probability of winning or losing on that trade. That's an error. And then the final error to track is inadvertently entering or exiting a trade. This is you tried to click around and you enter the trade and didn't realize it and now it costs you money. You want to record that as an error and you uh, want to log it for future reference. I know that was a lot to trade, but that was a lot to listen to and learn from. Are there any questions, Landau? Let's keep it to major questions that I can answer. I, we're way over our time. Yeah, we got a question from Jamie C. He says, is a five-month record of trading profitably good enough to jump into full-time? And I'd say in my experience, it was <laughs> Lando, give me a second. I'm sorry. Give me a second. Okay, no problem. I need to switch my headset because that one is... Okay, say it, try again, Lando. I almost thought the baby was coming or something there. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. But um, Jamie C says, is a five month record of trading profitably good enough to jump into full time? And I said, in my experience, it wasn't. Uh, it also depends on not only tenure or period, but it also depends on how many trades you're talking about. Are those are those trades live? What is the expectancy from those trades? If you tell me I've been doing this for five months and I've been focused and I've got 2000 trades and 1500 of them are live and I'm getting three ticks per contract expectancy live, I would say maybe, yeah. If you have, if you've, you have the money to pay your bills and you don't have financial pressures and things, it's probably worth a shot. This seems to be your market regime and you should go for it. Five months is, you're right though, five months is a short time. What else do we have? We had another question a while back. Um, Mike says, what's your full stop hit percentage? Um, he says that in general, it seems that your stops are pretty tight in his opinion. They are because as I showed on Edge Pro X here, a lot of times <clears throat> the market's coming into an area where, you know, I wanna I wanna buy 
this stock zone area and I see the move and I end up taking, getting an early, you know, taking information risk versus price risk, I end up take, getting an early, say at 93.50 instead of waiting to 95.50. Well, I don't want to wait. You can see where my stop is now at uh, 46.90.50 on the screen here. That's in the middle of nowhere. I don't need it to be that wide because if it breaks through the stock zone in that last low, it's very likely going to take out my stop. So in that case, I move that stop two points to just uh, below or inside of that stock zone. Uh, so that's why a lot of times, you know, the, the traders in Convergent will, in the head trader channels, we're going through, um, see that I'm not giving the trade much room. The other thing is this. If I get in and I get my first scale and it hits a structural level, it hits just like we did here. It hit the next stock zone area, the century figure at 47, and it comes all the way back and it looks like it is making a structure and it's starting to fall. I am closing that trade anyway because I already got my first scale and it wasn't able to hold and maintain pressure in that direction. So it's a very, very high probability that my stop would get hit and I have no interest in that. But what comes with that also is I have no fear of the market. So if I need to jump back in in the same direction at a worse price, I don't mind doing that once it starts to flow again. So I, I have a structured stop or a structured trade, but I also have the experience and I don't recommend this for everybody to make adjustments based on the context of what I'm trading. But early on, set your scheme like I'm doing here with this strategy, set your screen scheme and let it, keep your hands off and let it trade uh, because more likely than not, people will interfere with it. Okay, there's two more I think we should hit. Um, Kova says, why scale out profits at three different price levels? Um, in three different R levels if you never scale out your stop? And uh, should you always take profit or should you always take profit or loss on your full position? Well, the alternative is uh, being right. So I don't scale out my stop because it's defined. The first thing I'm doing is defining risk. So the first thing I'm doing is knowing that, hey, I am risking nine points. So whether I'm trading a 12 lot or a 100 lot, I'm risking uh, three points, I mean. Um, so three lots for three for three points, so nine points. Doesn't matter, so I can size up or down. But I'm not um, an oracle, and I don't know the future. And I can't tell myself that it either goes 62 ticks or I'm gonna get stopped and that's it. What that would require me is to be very, very, very accurate. I'm not a machine. I have better capabilities than a machine because I'm able to assess things as they happen. As long as our emotional interference is low, we understand our, our emotions and are centered, we can stay current with the auction and see that things are developing as they develop. But I, I'm um, my my interest is defining how much risk I'm going to take. And my interest is mitigating that risk, and that's what that first scale out does. The first scale out gives me a profit, in this case, of three points, almost three points on a one lot, and I can take those three points and credit them to the other two stops that I have remaining. And so I'm scaling out because I can never tell what the market's intention is. I guess to the best of my ability. But really, if I was trading, say, a 24 lot, the scheme would look different. So I have a different scheme for that. And the scheme would be take a third at the first scale, then take a bulk in the middle at the second scale, one full rotation, and then take a little bit more above that structurally and then leave a runner on of maybe two or three contracts. So the distribution is, is um, Gaussian or it's curved. because my goal is always to one know my know my risk to mitigate the risk as soon as i get in if i can improve my risk now imagine if you traded a 24 lot and you had a four point stop and a 
14 point target and it goes 13 and a half points and it starts to trickle back and now it's trickling back and it's trickling back. Now your choice is break even or take a stop. You got nothing out of the risk that you had. Most people argue, well, why should I scale out when my stop is full size? I expect my stop, my full stop to get hit of about a third of the time. So it makes mathematically takes care of that. So have a spreadsheet, understand the rotations, understand your trading scheme, compute mathematically, mathematically your R factor and keep track of how often you get stopped so you can adjust things so that they make sense for you in your time frame, in your trading method. So um, this is why I always say trading all in, all out is not a thing I'd be very good at. Trading a one lot is not a good thing for me because I need to be able to scale out. I need to be able to, to have that scale out in order to keep assessing the market at low cost. That first scale out is helping me finance or fund the trade. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, Javi says, any advice about how we can improve and become pro while, while having another full-time job? That gets asked a lot. Um, it really depends on your job. But what I would do is reframe the market in terms of that time slot that you can trade. Uh, for example, let's say you are on, uh, let's say you're trading U.S. markets and you're in Europe. So the, the in, in Europe, say in Frankfurt or let's say in London, uh, the U.S. markets open at 2.30 p.m. in London. Are you able to structure your day so that you can catch 2.30 to 4.30 London time and trade the first two hours of the day? If not, then should you be trading something else? Well, I have a full-time job and I work from 9 till 5. Okay, have you considered trading the Nikkei? If you're trading the Nikkei from this time to this time, are you able to find a statistical edge? Are you able to pretend almost like the market's only open for that time period you want to trade and do your homework accordingly? Uh, so that's what I would do. I would either carve out, if you're somebody who's working remotely, carve out the time, the most significant time to trade, and only focus on that time. So your rotational statistics, all of your statistical studies, and by the way, this is something that's key, right? This is uh, the, the market stats report is something we produce for all members that tells us the statistical occurrence of any event, very important to know, but we would be running these statistical studies for the time period that we where we can trade. And we have these for all the major products that I listed, and QES, RTY, ZN, and so on. And we could see that some things have a statistical edge. So if it's very low, if it's bright orange or bright blue, that's a statistical, historical statistical edge, okay? The market touches the overnight high or the overnight low in a day session 90.39% uh, uh, of the time. This number used to be 98%, but 98% has gone to 90 because the overnight session has been where the action is over the last three years. So I can create something around that. It becomes a target. The IB is broken, the IB high or lo low is broken in a day session 97.5% of the time. Wow, that is a huge statistical edge. So if I get long and the IB stat has not been breached and we're heading towards the IB high or low, that becomes a key high probability target. There's gonna be a scale out there. Uh, things like that. So having creating a statistical edge around whatever time frame you can trade becomes a, a key part of that. What you can trade, what time, that's a personal thing, but you can carve out a couple of hours a day where you can be active and then throw in another hour to do the homework and so on, maybe do the homework over the weekend. In that situation also, day trading becomes tougher because you need to keep up with the market and have a lot of samples in order to uh, really uh, grow your edge, but you can do that. You can you can decide that hey, I'm only going to trade the last hour. You can form an entire structure. I can form an entire plan 
to trade the last hour that would have an edge, in my opinion. Okay. Anything else? Take though? care of everything, guys. Uh, there was a handful of questions about uh, convergent trading and platforms and stuff like that. If you guys have any questions, email us at support at convergenttrading.com and I'll get back to you guys shortly on anything convergent related or anything like that. Very cool. Thanks so much for that, Lando. We ran over our time by 25 minutes. There was a lot to cover there, a lot more than I expected. Hopefully you gained something today to help you refocus your energy and to move towards achieving your goal. If you have questions, as Landau said, please uh, hit us up on Twitter at ConvTrading.com. You can all of uh, ConvTrading, uh, or you can go to the website and leave us a contact form. Uh, go to the contact form and leave us a contact. You can find that at ConvergentTrading.com. I hope, I hope you learned something today. Good luck, and I'll catch you later. The recording will be out shortly. Take care.